Act. The Ministry of Higher Education and Scientific Research in Egypt. And um, I'm part of Work Package 4, which is uh, leading this webinar with uh, Siam Barry from Italy. Um, and uh, I would like to welcome you all today. This webinar is under the title of Possible Role of the International Research Consortium on the Food Nutrition uh, Security and uh, Sustainable Agriculture in the implementation of the AU EU Innovation Agenda. So the main aim of this uh, webinar and discussion today, just first to briefly present the outcomes of the Bright Shop and the IRC founding launch, which was held uh, last month in Accra, um, and discuss also the potential role of the IRC in supporting the EU, EU innovation agenda as part of its future strategy, with also some reflections from an expert workshop that was held also during the meeting in Accra by Leap for FNSSA. So just to briefly walk you through the agenda today, we will start by a presentation from Dr. Irene Frempong, the coordinator of the REAP for FNSA project, which she will be describing the IRC and um, the final manuscript of the, do the document of the IRC. And then Dr. Vincenzo Lorusso from the European Commission will be presenting first the AU EU uh, innovation agenda and then discussing the possible role of the IRC. Afterwards, uh, Wari from IITA will also be presenting some outcomes from the and recommendations from the workshop on the innovation and entrepreneurship, and also uh, reflecting on the innovation agenda. And then we will open the floor for discussion, so everyone has the chance to um, ask all the speakers uh, on the topics mentioned. Um, we will start by the presentation from Dr. Irene, reflections on the founding launch of the IRC. Dr. Irene, the floor is yours. I will share the screen now. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Nohan, for- Yes, for... yes, good morning. Good morning, good morning. can you hear me? Yes, we I can, can hear, you. hear you. Yeah. Thank you for putting the this webinar together. Um, thank you to Kakalo and to everyone for joining. Good morning to all and sundry. Um, this is our last webinar for the Leap for FNSSE project uh, officially, so I'm excited about it. And I, I feel that um, they, all the participants uh, together with others have contributed to uh, this um, incredible achievement uh, of the Leap for FNSSE project. So what I will do just to introduce the, the webinar is to touch a little bit on, on, on the, the launch of the International Research Consortium and uh, maybe highlight a few elements that may be relevant for the main presentation we'll be taking from Dr. Vincenzo. Next slide, please. So two main things um, that I will do, I'll show a, slides, a slide on what the IRC is about um, and then the implications of the launch of the IRC. Next slide. So I think we have been um, talking a lot um, about the International Research Consortium. And this slide is supposed to give um, the summary slide sort of. Um, and I wanted to put everything there so that I can I can speak um, to, to the issues of the IRC. Now we will describe the International Research Consortium as an AU EU bicontinental platform. Um, we are describing it as a network of networks that links all actors in research and innovation in Africa and Europe, in all the 82 or so member states to advance a science-led growth in a sustainable uh, manner, but on food uh, security, um, nutrition security and sustainability. And we're saying that this will be done based on equity and based on common priorities of the two continents 
uh, with the intention of ensuring that we're scaling uh, for impact and we're sure that uh, we will have global spillovers if we're able to do that effectively. So in terms of the International Research Consortium, where the membership really is across um, many actors, research, academia, uh, policymakers, funders, women uh, groups and youth, um, as well as uh, user organizations, farmers, private sector, more importantly, startups. So it, it covers a whole range of actors in the research and innovation continuum. And I think this is significant and that's why uh, the innovation agenda um, is, is, is um, positioned to be supported by the International Research uh, Consortium when it comes to matters of uh, food and nutrition security for sustainable agriculture. So the, the, the IRC, the International Research Consortium's main agenda is to deal with the issue of fragmentation that we have had for decades, uh, fragmentation in terms of um, actions in terms of the lot of actors that work uh, on FNSSA in terms of um, investments or funding. And, and th this fragmentation is, is so um, in, in, is, is, is pervasive, if I can use the word, that you would find a lot of duplication um, in terms of advancing the work of um, on food and nutrition security, a lot of duplication and that needs to be dealt with. And therefore it undermines the impact on the investments that have been made and that continues to be made. And so this is the central issue that um, has been mandated to the um, IRC. And, and that uh, we think the IRC is going to confront that by putting forward a coordination infrastructure, which is weak or sometimes not even existent, and also putting forward knowledge management mechanisms, uh, frameworks and dialogues on FNSSA. Uh, through that, um, we hope that we will build the necessary coherence and synergies to improve coordination um, of programs, of actions, and across different uh, actors. Now, so the IRC is organized, and I've put the, the governance uh, and coordination structure. Uh, the intention is not to talk about it, but to show the, the four elements of the IRC, how it is organized. Um, it has a strategic uh, component. It has uh, an advisory function component. It has a support function component, but more importantly, what I want to speak on is the operational function component. And you will see that um, the IRC intends to work um, with uh, groups and this, these working groups will be formed um, based on a number of things, based on themes, based on uh, interests, um, based on, on um, maybe strategic uh, focus, depending on what's going on. And, and at the operational level, we're, we're seeing that we're going to work from local level through national levels, through regional and continental levels. So it sort of has, all the cascading effect from local agendas right down to continental and global um, as a way of ensuring we contribute to the agendas from the local setting where innovation actually uh, is expected to happen and, and co-created through to ad addressing uh, national agendas, uh, regional agendas, and of course, global agendas. So this the, the, the configuration that is being anticipated uh, when it comes to the IRC. And um, this is what positions the IRC to be supportive of uh, an agenda like the um, 
innovation agenda. Next slide. Again, on the IRC, because we are going to listen to the innovation agenda, I wanted to highlight the five elements uh, of the functions and services that the IRC uh, will be um, responsible for. The first is to work towards increasing synergies and coherence uh, between actors. I've mentioned a whole range of actors. And these actors are the same actors that would, as it were, implement the innovation agenda. It will work to increase access to a learning environment and a knowledge uh, base, including uh, monitoring, evaluation, and learning, and capacity building. Now, this is central um, because at the end of the day, the, 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 the strategy um, of ensuring that we avoid duplication is ensuring that all actors have the opportunity to know what is going on uh, in terms of FNSSA, who, which, which projects and initiatives are ongoing, which partners um, are um, working on what and with whom and, and what time, who is funding it. Now, we believe that this entry point is what helps to reduce uh, duplication and of course, improves uh, coherence of, of actions. The third part, of course, is capacity development. That um, you know, is the elephant in the room. If all that we're going to um, do and all we expect to do and the impact we've uh, put for ourselves would happen, capacity development should be at the, at the core of, of uh, everything on both continents. And I see that as um, we listen to the innovation agenda, the element of capacity, uh, particularly for science, will be highlighted uh, very clearly. Um, again, on, fourthly, we will tackle the issue of sustainable and inclusive governance structure to ensure that across the actors of the International Research Consortium, uh, from local level through to continental and, and, and global levels. Um, all actors will have uh, input into decisions um, depending on the rules that they play. And that's how we can ensure that local priorities and local interests are also feeding into um, final priorities at national, regional and uh, continental and bicontinental levels. Lastly, uh, strengthening the science policy interface um, is uh, something that we have worked on, uh, even in the Leaf for FNSSA project. It is critical that we continue to strengthen that interface, particularly through the high level policy dialogue, which is the, the main um, policy process that's advancing uh, the AU EU uh, international cooperation. Um, going forward. Um, next slide. So I think I would then, having sort of introduced what the IRC is about, just talk a little bit about the lunch and re re reflect a little bit uh, on, on it. Uh, as part of our general assembly, in fact, the final general assembly of the Leaf for FNSSA project, uh, we launched the International Research Consortium. And this was done in a plenary se session of the uh, Science Policy uh, for Agriculture Conference in Accra. And um, this launch is important and significant because the IRC's uh, development has been done over four years uh, with highlights in the last year when uh, structures were developed. And so the launch actually presents uh, to us the, the grand finale, if I can say that, is the final uh, deliverable of the Leap for FNSSA project. We enjoyed about 1,000 um, participants in that uh, plenary session when it was launched, 300 uh, in person, around 600 um, from online um, from different institutions, countries, 
across the globe. Again, we enjoyed very high level participation from the European Commission and the Africa Union and ministries, private sector research and innovation practitioners. Um, then the launch itself, as I said, um, then closes the, the picture of closes the project in terms of what we've been trying to do over the last four years. And you can see in your launch there, our moderator and the uh, section of the participants, in-person uh, participants uh, during the launch. Next slide. Now for our next presentation, I want to also highlight that the, the launch of the IRC implied that we have put forward three success factors for its operationalization and therefore has implications for the implementation of the innovation agenda. First, we have, we have launched and put forward a document that describes the structures of the IRC and of course also presents guidelines for its establishment. Second, we have put forward a growing number of institutions expressing their uh, interests to join the IRC. Um, so far we had, um, at the time of the launch, we had 29 institutions that had signed declarations um, at the highest uh, authority within those institutions. As we speak, we have about 40 now. So it tells you the pace at which we're growing and I'm sure that we're going to grow um, even in the coming uh, months uh, before the operationalization of the IRC. Also, thirdly, the launch um, also implied that we have put forward tangible deliverables that will be the basis for implementing the IRC. And this include knowledge management tools. We have a huge uh, project database on FNSSA, over 300 projects. Uh, being captured with the opportunity also of linking with other databases from the GRC, uh, from FARA, from, from other, from, from the CG, to be able to provide this knowledge uh, base that we're talking about. And of course, we've also put forward a credible website that we will continue to maintain uh, in the bridging period uh, before the operationalization of the IRC. Next slide. So it's well, on the slide was me presenting, of course, at the launch. And this slide shows the, the head of the EU delegation in, in Accra and the ambassador actually to Ghana, uh, who also presented during the launch. So beyond the launch, what, what, what are we talking about? There's a vigorous effort to ensure that there is a continuum between the launch and the time that the, the IRC will be operationalized. Um, we're going to focus on enlarging the membership um, of the IRC, uh, strengthen institutional commitment in member states. I think this is where we think we will build uh, sustainability for the IRC the member states and the ministries within the member states uh, will be important towards the, the, the funding and implementation of the actions under the IRC. We'd also prepare um, for the operationalization phase itself. So webinars like this, where we understand more um, what is out there, particularly within the AU and EU um, arena, um, the innovation agenda as an example, will take on board what it means as we prepare for the operationalization of the IRC. It is envisaged that uh, operationalization will begin by the end of 2023. And I think that's a good time uh, to usher in the implementation of the FNSSA aspect of the innovation agenda, at least in the, in the short term, some of the short term actions that the agenda may put forward. So um, these are the big uh, things that I think I want to draw our attention to that we will be uh, driving uh, during, um, after the launch, uh, but before the operationalization of the IRC. Um, next slide. 
I think it's my last slide, is just to say thank you and to um, com continue to um, spread the word about the IRC. Um, all members within or all institutions within the research and innovation fraternity are eligible. And so um, we will invite as many as are willing to, to join the IRC. Thank you very much, Norman, for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Irene, for sharing with us the outcomes of the successful launch in Accra. And I think the document, the manuscript is available on the website for everyone to check the IRC document. And now we move on to our next presentation, the key topic of today, the um, joint AU-EU innovation agenda. And I would like to ask Dr. Vincenzo Loroso. It's our pleasure that you're here with us today. Please, the floor is yours. I will share the screen just one second. Thank you very much, Noren, and a very good morning and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, Noren, in case this was easier, I could also share the PowerPoint from my side because I, I acknowledge I sent you a PDF from the file. Uh, just let me know what suits you better. It's whatever you prefer. I have it here with. Okay, so it's... yeah, let, perhaps let me let me try let me try and share from my side so that I can, I can control it while while I while I talk. And, uh, unless then the display is not as nice as from your side, because sometimes we do have some, some spots. Can you see the screen okay? Yes, but uh, still not in presentation. Yes, this is, yes, we can see it clearly now, thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. So a, a, very, a very good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I, I'm very pleased to see a few familiar names, if not faces online. It is a, indeed a great pleasure for me on behalf of the European Commission DG Research and Innovation to uh, be conveying uh, some messages on the, um, well, on the innovation agenda, on the AU, EU innovation agenda and its potential, uh, well, and the roles that are linked to that uh, within the innovation agenda for the IRC, uh, of which we heard just a second ago from Dr. Irene. And I, I like to stress the fact that in here, in my title, I put roles in the plural form, because indeed, as Dr. Irene was referring to, there are indeed there is indeed a plethora of opportunities that are uh, linked to this IRC now being launched. And perhaps before even getting started, I'd like to say that at a personal level, I'm even extra happy for being here among you today in this particular uh, webinar, which, as I understand it, is the last one of the series of the Leave for FNSSA. And I like to to say this because indeed, no later than uh, two years ago, when I wasn't at the commission yet, and I was actually on the stakeholder side working in the area of uh, indeed a EU, EU cooperation in the pharmaceutical sector but also at the interface with the public health and rural development in cooperation with countries such as Nigeria and Uganda I'd indeed become a fan of these webinar series and I indeed uh, discovered them on YouTube and started following them with vivid interest so for me it's a particular extra meaningful uh, opportunity to be here today on this uh, last webinar of series which of course they're going to be renewed in other you know the formats i'm sure and as we get into today's presentation after this introduction i also believe that uh, it is not only timely but absolutely needed to talk about this irc and indeed to have uh, to launch and implement an irc an international research consortium uh, on food and nutrition security and sustainable agriculture encompassing both Europe and Africa at these times that indeed are very much challenged at geopolitical level, but also when we look at a climate crisis from a climate crisis point of view. And everything inevitably is indeed very much intertwined and connected with food security. And food security in turn is also connected with global health. I like to say that food security is indeed global health. In just two years, as you can see from this slide, the number of people facing uh, hunger or at least acute food insecurity have increased uh, from the figures that you see in this slide and accounting for uh, approximately 350 million in 82 countries as we speak. Now fueled by conflict, climate shocks and COVID-19, the crisis is escalating and indeed the provision of supplies that also help enhance productivity and sustainable agriculture are also occurring. Africa is inevitably very much affected in this whole global value chain based system. And I like to say that it not only is the pandemic, not only is the war in Ukraine that are 
also affecting importantly affecting provision and supplies of uh, stable uh, foods to, to Africa. But climate change is having a major role. Recent data are indeed showing that in the year 2022, in the first semester of this year, imports of wheat to Africa has been majorly decreased, not only due to the war in Ukraine, but also from the, due to the drought in Canada and the United States. So really climate change is at stake and indeed food security is very much impacted by all these global events. So now let's talk about this African Union, European Union innovation, innovation agenda. What is it? It is like we call it an unprecedented and ambitious joint initiative, joint indeed between the European Union and the African Union that aims to foster the translation of research and innovation into tangible products, services, businesses and jobs in Africa as much as in Europe. It will represent the mainstay of the AUU cooperation in research and innovation for the next decade. This AU EU innovation agenda was conceived for the first time in July 2020 during the first ever AU EU ministerial meeting of research and innovation ministers from the African Union and the European Union, when it was acknowledged that innovation ecosystems had been growing at an unprecedented pace in both Africa and Europe over the past decade, but yet there more needs to be done to ensure research and innovation activities are indeed generating concrete outputs on the ground and therefore generating positive, tangible impact on the ground. The draft AU innovation agenda was published earlier this year in the month of February. As you can see from this slide in here, it entails four objectives that are then articulated into different short-term, medium-term and long-term actions, according to the four priority areas of the AU-EU cooperation in science, technology and innovation. These are, as a lot of you in the virtual room know, public health, green transition, the green transition priority area encompasses the two sub areas of food and nutrition security and sustainable agriculture, FNSSA, and climate change and sustainable energy, CCSE. And then the third area, very broad, the one of innovation and technology, and the fourth one of capacities for science. Now, for those of you already familiar with the draft AU EU innovation agenda, you would know that there's also an additional stream of actions that is proposed under the name of cross cutting issues, because indeed, such actions do span across all the four I mentioned, uh, above mentioned, excuse me, uh, priority areas. These actions were and the objectives were defined based on mapping of gaps and needs for each of the priority areas that was done over more than a year time, concertedly under the ages of the AU-EU high-level policy dialogue on science, technology and innovation. This year, 2022, is the year of the so-called uh, stakeholder dialogue process that we haven't really on this draft AU EU innovation agenda. The purpose really is to uh, expose documents to the views, feedback, and input coming from stakeholders across these areas to make sure that the final version of the agenda will address the actual unmet needs on the ground. And we started the process with a public consultation online that was kept open between the mid February, February 14th, and the end of June. I take this opportunity also to say that the outcome of this consultation is available online. I'll share the link in the chat. Uh, in, in a second, well, after my presentation, it was published at the end of uh, last week. Stakeholders will be notified also with a doc email. And also we move into a big stakeholder event, which will take place in Nairobi on November 23rd and 24th, so in a month. Following these uh, consultations, we'll make sure that the views that will be gathered through these initiatives will be reflected in the final version of the agenda, which is expected to be adopted by mid next year. So the timing that we heard about the implementation of the IRC mentioned by Dr. Arin is indeed absolutely perfect, if I may say. What is also unprecedented about this AU innovation agenda, and that falls in my view completely in line with the strategy of the IRC, is the fact that this is conceived from the beginning of it, from the conceptualization phase until the implementation as a multi-stakeholder initiative that not only encompasses policy makers and public institutions, but also entails the involvement of the private sectors, SMEs, startups, incubators, large corporations as well, and also importantly, NGOs and civil societies organizations. Of course, being wary of the importance and the need for involving women, youth, and vulnerable uh, people as well. So these are points that will be also particularly flagged and addressed during the discussions of the stakeholder events in Nairobi. So these are the actions, and of course, you haven't got the time to go into the details of them, organized in, this, in the next few slides according to the timeline 
By short term, we mean actions that will be implemented within the next three years, starting from next year, so until 2026. By medium term, we mean actions that will be implemented within the next five to six years. And by long term, we mean actions that will be implemented within the next 10 years. In this exercise, I try to highlight actions that in my view could be indeed pertinent to the scope and the mission of the IRC in, uh, on food and nutrition security. Now, as you can see very briefly on the cross-cutting issues, we'll see networking of business, government, higher education, and NPO sectors through platforms. So it's just an example of proactive involvement of citizens in the innovation ecosystem, identifying sharing climate resilience adaptation practices according to SDG 13, fostering the participation of financing partners. I think that exactly all these actions are indeed absolutely uh, relevant and within the mandate of the IRC within which it has been conceived. Now, importantly, you can see that within the green transition short-term actions, that is not yet should I say, a specific action that specifically focus for, on food and nutrition security and sustainable agriculture. This point was also flagged by some stakeholders during the public consultation and is also indeed reflected in the report that was just published online. But several actions indeed are indeed fitting the mandate of the IRC and they are within the area of innovation and technology and capacities for science. I will just move on. You will receive a copy of this presentation to get more into the details of it. And for the medium term actions, I did the same exercise and try and highlight the actions that in my view are indeed most pertinent to the scope and the mission of the IRC on FNSSA. Now, number one on the green transition, pretty clearly, fostering digital applications and green technologies for agroecological production, healthy and sustainable food processing and consumption, or for the capacities for science, promoting joint master doctoral degrees between AU universities, mobilities of researchers and create enabling STI environment for sustainable innovation ecosystems, according to the quadruple ELIX approach. And moving finally to the long-term actions, there's indeed a few, well, actually quite a few that in my view are indeed fitting uh, very well with the mandate and the strategy of the uh, IRC. And perhaps I will mention the one on green transition, improving the agricultural innovation ecosystems to co-invent in startups and agro uh, SMEs, small and medium enterprises. I like also to try and make this conversation as practical as possible, because if somebody asked, what do we expect as a tangible deliverable that is expected to be generated by the work of the AU EU innovation agenda in the area of FNSSA, I would say development of value chains across food systems within the African continent in a way that is sustainable. As an example, moving from tomatoes to tomato sauce, as an example, moving from uh, milk to dairy industries and being able to do so in a way that is indeed sustainable within the African continent. So innovation in this case not, not, does not necessarily stand for something that is at a pilot stage or incredibly novel. It could be about employing and leveraging technologies and methods that are already there, but bringing them to scale in a way that can be repeated and, and done so sustainably. So the concepts of social innovation and frugal innovation will also be included in such an approach. I was mentioning the fact that the public, the online public consultation has been done and been carried out until June 30th. And I've taken this opportunity to thank all those stakeholders, all those colleagues and friends that have provided their input to it. I saw a few names that indeed are familiar to me now also thanks to the consultation. These are the main takeaways from the online consultation available by clicking on the link in here. So the consultation overall, the feedback we received very much welcome the agenda and endorse its objectives and actions. Respondents highlighted the need to build on the good results that have already been achieved by the joint work on the, uh, well, basically on the cooperation between uh, the AU and EU in research and innovation, including in food and nutrition security and sustainable agriculture. So no need to reinvent the wheel, but really to build and enhance the good that has already been done jointly together. Of course, involving uh, different sectors from the public one to the private NGOs, CSOs, and so on and so forth. The need to enhance capacities, and this was also mentioned by Dr. Arini in a presentation, in terms of research infrastructure, training of staff and students as well, and including also providing mobility and exchanges opportunities and funding was also very frequently mentioned. Importantly, respondents emphasized the importance of monitoring and evaluation results in order to, to make sure we measure the impact that is generated by the work of the agenda. And then we can look back and really 
take best best practices on board and continue with them and learn from things that perhaps do not work as well. Last point is that while the public consultation acknowledged the huge importance of researchers and research institutions as the main beneficiaries, so to say, of the work of the agenda, the public consultation also acknowledged the importance of other stakeholders across the innovation value chains, including higher education institutions, but also schools, primary schools and secondary schools, local communities in both urban and rural areas, leveraging and protecting the indigenous knowledge and savoir faire, empowering youth, women and vulnerable, vulnerable groups, including persons with disabilities, and importantly, engaging the African diaspora. So with that, I'll link this to the upcoming AU in EU Innovation Agenda Stakeholder event, which is taking place in a month in Nairobi. The event will also be possible to attend it online, in, uh, indeed, by, by registering on the website, of which we'll find the link in here. Although we are, of course, encouraging, when possible, presence in person, because indeed, as you can imagine, it allows really interaction and brainstormers and therefore provides networking opportunities. Now, discussions will happen in plenary sessions and also in thematic workshops, and one of them will be entirely dedicated to food and nutrition security and sustainable agriculture. What's the overall goal, if I had to summarize it in a nutshell, of these upcoming AU EU stakeholder events? It's actually dual. Number one, to gather further views on the innovation agenda, on the draft of the agenda, coming and building on what we have gathered already for the online public consultation, and at the same time, discuss on concrete implementation actions, and therefore, start a process of co-creation of the implementation plan of the AU EU innovation agenda. There will also be an innovation fair, the so-called Meet the Innovators, which will take place on the second day of the two. And in the spirit of the agenda, we will start some way somehow implementing the agenda through some training and information sessions in the, in the morning of the second day of the event. Again, the link to the registration is here. I will also put it in the chat. Some invitations will start be sending out uh, today as well. So really, this is going to be a, 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 a an ongoing and a continuous process for the next few days or a couple of weeks for certain. So we very much look forward to seeing you hopefully in Nairobi, otherwise, if not online, but please, if possible, try and make it in person. And with that, I'll lead into the final part of this presentation of what could be within this AU EU innovation agenda, the potential role of the IRC. Well, first, I'd like to say that the IRC and the AU innovation agenda represent to one another an unparalleled opportunity that have not been there before. So really something that should be leveraged accordingly. And what could be the potential role of the IRC on food and nutrition security and sustainable agriculture within the context of the innovation agenda? Well, first of all, the IRC, I thought, could, could act as a enabler, a promoter and catalyst of what, in case you wondered, projects and program and also funding opportunities, as was mentioned by Dr. Irene. Moving forward, the IRC could also represent a capacity builder, a capacity creator and builder indeed. I remember in some of the earlier conversations that I was lucky to have with Dr. Irene, she mentioned the fact that in a vision, she would like, if I recall it correctly, if I could quote her correctly, the IRC could be seen as a sort of bedrock for higher education and research institutions. I quite like the expression, and with that spirit, I believe the IRC could do so, indeed in both human development and research infrastructures. And I truly believe that these two aspects need to go hand in hand. We cannot build and enhance infrastructures if you have, if you haven't got the right skills on site. And therefore, doing so interacting with students, researchers, farmers, organizations, organization of uh, the former as well, the different categories indeed. The IRC could also represent a network maker. By network maker, to whom? Stakeholders and organizations across sectors. I liked the definition that was used earlier on and also reflecting the concept note that the IRC is indeed a network of networks. So, I mean, what entity, if not the IRC, to represent a network maker in this space? The IRC could also represent a stock taker, a stock taker indeed looking back, taking stock of what was done with a forward looking insight and basically to build on, on the good that was generated in terms of projects and programs in the same spirit of the AU as the AU EU innovation agenda. Also a forward looking strategic reference in this spirit to who? In this case, to stakeholders and organizations that indeed may approach the IRC and at some point decide to be part of the consortium. And I'm very pleased to hear about these 40 expression of interest institutions that have already signed declaration. I think it's extremely encouraging and exciting to hear about this, but I think it's also important as the work and implementation of the IRC moves on with years and new organizations shape are created, they can also then refer 
and then learn about the IRC and then possibly join while the organization really in increases in size. So I think that's also pretty exciting looking ahead. The IRC could also represent a steady interlocutor for who, in this case, the policymakers and therefore the AU UI level policy dialogue on STI, which is indeed, as Dr. Arim was mentioning, the platform, the policy platform when the long term policy priorities are established for the AU EU cooperation in research and innovation. Something for the uh, HLPD to, to touch base with regularly and indeed learn from what's happening on the ground. Basically, therefore, a very key interlocutor that would be the role that in this vision could be represented by the IRC. And the last point, the IRC could also be a guarantor of coherence, alignment and synergies. And some of these keywords were also mentioned in Dr. Irene's presentation. And for what, again, also vis-a-vis -vis the policy. And this is also a role that is expected out of the IRC in the upcoming stakeholder event in the FNSSA related workshop, where we will expect indeed to make sure that initiatives are shared, programs are shared, because there's quite a few, regardless of the funders and regardless of the institutions, but what is important is indeed to try and maximize the impact on the ground by creating alignments, if not, hopefully, synergies. And that will be my last slide. So all in all, the IRC could be indeed a key implementer of actions of the AU EU innovation agenda in the area of food and nutrition security and sustainable agriculture, but also beyond, especially in the area of capacities for science and innovation and technology, if you use the priority area definition of the AU EU cooperation in research and innovation. With that, I would like to thank you all very much for your attention. I'll be more than happy to answer any questions if time is allowed for that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Vincenzo, for this very informative and uh, very interesting presentation. I've also added the link to the stakeholder event you mentioned in the chat box for everyone to follow. Uh, I think, yes, we have time for questions, but maybe we just uh, briefly uh, have our final presentation and then we open the floor uh, for discussion. Thank you. So I would like to ask uh, Wali Aguioi for the um, final presentation, Insights from an Expert Workshop that was also held in uh, Accra last September on innovation and entrepreneurship. And he will also reflect on the innovation agenda just presented by Dr. Vincenzo now. Wali, please, the floor is yours. Okay, um, thank you so much, Dr. Nuan and Dr. Irene for giving this opportunity. I, I don't know if it is possible that I uh, control the slide on my end. That may make it easier if it's possible. Uh, um, thank you. So, let me put it on presentation mode. Okay, can you can you see this? Yes, we can okay, see it now. Please right. go ahead, Juan. Thank you. So thank you so much once again for giving me the opportunity to uh, present this. And um, basically, I'll be looking at uh, some of the things that uh, responded to some of the issues that um, Dr. Vincenzo has raised from his very insightful presentation. And uh, my work is very simple. It's basically to uh, get some insight out from the expert workshop that was organized on September 13 in Accra. And um, we, we discussed on various things on trade, innovation, and entrepreneurship. And there are few uh, insights that came out from it, which are already even responding to some of the issues that the Vincenzo has raised as a, um, some of the things that IRC could focus on. So as to manage our time, I will just go straight into the insights. Um, of course, I said by way of introduction, this was uh, organized and uh, it was a result of two studies commissioned by the task 1.3 of the lip 4 FNSSC. And um, there was an opportunity for the uh, studies to be presented with as part of union um, gotten and there are some recommendations that emerge from the workshop. 
Uh, the one of the first things that um, came out from it is the need to invest in transformative gender and youth approach, that this is not just about the inclusiveness of just uh, adding men, women and youth, or men and women, but basically going beyond that to, to look at what works, who are the actors involved in this, and um, also ensuring that there is a qualitative and quantitative um, um, approach to, to getting this done to ensure that there can be a uh, transformative agenda setting. And there was also a case about investing in capacity building, you know, research and uh, innovation to include gender and youth. And this is not just gonna be a very easy, um, way through, there will have to be difficult questions of why, why do we need to um, invest in this? And this will be critical in uh, going forward. Uh, there was also an idea about um, contextual approach research, which will be very important to enhance the inclusion of women and youth in Anna and High, as um, gender constraints are, they are more of local norms, uh, they are context specific, what is happening in one area is not the same thing as what is happening in, on, in the other area. So there is need to contextualize the uh, different approaches. And um, there was also the idea of um, focusing on long time drivers to understand what works and what does not work, to, to see what is happening in Europe and um, how is it done in, in, in Africa and um, connecting it to not just looking at the short term issues. Uh, seeing that there is a foresight thinking in, in, in our approach for what we are doing. And there is also a case of um, scaling of, um, of innovations and making it context specific because there is not a one size fits all approach. Um, I, I like the fact that you, you talked about, um, a, 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 about innovation and the need to, to, to consider frugal innovation. It doesn't have to be very big to, to make an impact and looking at context specific, there are cultural issues that will not make one great innovation to work in another place, are great ecological issues, um, which is important to contextualize even the scaling of the innovation. And it's not just about scaling up, it's also important to think about um, other, other issues in this case. And it's also, um, there was also an idea about uh, moving beyond formal value chain um, approach research to include the informal sector in this. And as a way of also improving the framework for understanding the informal cross broader trade and the market interaction to support these patterns. These are key issues that um, were brought forward as one of the areas that um, can be considered for the IRC, and um, in terms of the, the policy makers, there's need to develop evidence-based pathways for, for policy makers. And this also connects with some of the uh, issues raised by Dr. Vincenzo in this, as one of the things that uh, roles that IRC can play. And uh, we also consider the, in, in the case of financial institutional engagements. It needs to, to, to their, their role needs to really come out very well now. And the play, place of the private sector to scale in innovation, the research institution really can develop the innovation, but private sector are critical in, in scaling this innovation. And um, the importance of uh, doing a kind of a cost benefit analysis of all this innovation to make it attractive for private sector also um, came to the forefront in this case. And um, and the mapping of solution that works and the one that did not work. We, we know that um, there's also a lot of lessons that can be learned from um, solution that works. And there are solutions that are working in one location that may be useful to other location with a little bit of tweaking. This uh, uh, will be required as we move forward based on some of the input that came in from the ESPA studies. And um, our I'm on my last, last slide, so as to make it simple and give um, more opportunity for questions and discussion. They need to incorporate sustainability beyond production and consumption. Somebody call it the, the other side of the coin by embracing the food system approach was also um, came to the forefront during um, the expert study. And also taking into account local context, 
and uh, comparative advantages of specific countries and spe specific crops. This will require to also be very open. There will be some losers and winners, and so that there will be a, um, a way to be able to shift uh, base on the comparative advantages. And some crops will be very great for some countries. Um, it's not a one size fits all where everybody needs to work on the same thing. It's, there has to be this um, local context that has to be considered in the, in, the, uh, in the future. And also facilitating dialogues that brings together all stakeholders from the beginning will be very critical for IRC uh, based on some of the um, comments and recommendations that came from the, the SPAT workshop. So this is my last slide. Um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Wally, so much for this uh, brief but very interesting and informative presentation and the um, workshop that happened uh, in Accra as well. And I think we have um, still time to open the discussion now. Um, you can either write the questions in the chat or you can just raise your hand and we get a chance to discuss this together. So please, again, if you have any uh, questions or points to discuss with all our speakers, they are available now. Just raise your hand. You can get the chance to discuss it with them directly, or you can just type your question in the chat box. I think we have uh, Chris. Okay, um, thank you very much. Thank you to all the speakers. Uh, my name is Chris. To know it's it's actually a great policy that is um this this partnership between the AU and the EU. It's actually a great one for needed to drive um, growth and development on both sides of um, uh, the continent. Um, I would like to know are there measures in place in local communities can have access to to funds as uh, because i see that lots of the a whole huge chunk uh, within this policy um front is is about um financing so um there, i think there is need to to clarify um the position of financing and accessibility thank you chris so dr vincenzo would you like to get back to this question okay thank, thank you Nora, and, and thank you very much uh, chris uh, for for your question indeed uh, ultimately uh, we will have to, to to put the actions and the instruments to to ensure the implementation of, of these actions as you say well what, what is important to consider is that these au eu innovation agenda foresees the use of several numerous instruments to allow its implementation. So basically not just coming from one side, coming from the AU, but also coming from the EU and not just coming from one particular package, also several instruments. It could be uh, for early stage initiative, for it, it could be, for example, the Horizon Europe Framework Programme and its Africa Initiative package of actions, but it could also be other initiatives coming from other actors and other in international financial institutions. So. To try and answer your question in, in a sentence, absolutely, ultimately, there will be projects involved in local communities and therefore uh, in the area of food and nutrition security and sustainable agriculture, absolutely that. And there's already quite a few program projects that are involved in that space. I'm thinking of the projects that are run uh, and, and supported from the European Commission, DG International Partnerships, for example. Uh, also, what, import what is important in my view to consider is the fact that we are trying to do our best to involve local communities in this phase of the conceptualization, so in this phase of the dialogue. So indeed to make sure that we get their views reflected in the document in a way that indeed the policy is aligned to the needs as much as possible. So yes, I mean, the involvement of local communities should be there and I believe is already, already there, but of course we can try and do more. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You.
I think we have a couple of questions in the chat. Just one second. Lauren, you are muted. Thank you, Carlo. <laughs> um, okay, so I, I was just saying that we have a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, I will just go through them. Um, I think two are asking about joining the IRC during the session. I think uh, maybe, Carlo, you can add the link uh, in the chat for them. And I think there is one question. What's the role of Horizon Europe and funded project for the implementation of the objectives? of the AU EU innovation agenda and partnership. Um, and I think we have um, some raised hands as well. Uh, maybe we start by the ones raising their hands. We have Moses, please, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Nohan, and um, all the presenters, um, Irene, Vicenzo, and uh, Wale, I think was the last one. Uh, my name is Moses Osiri. First of all, um, I work uh, with uh, PASET, which is the Partnership for Skills in Applied Sciences, Engineering, and Technology. We support um, capacities for science, if I may put it in your words. Um, my question was, um, and first of all, to say thank you for the initiative. I think this is excellent. Um, I also think it's helpful to um, to bring together the capacities across the continents, Europe and Africa. And I think within the context of uh, the food systems approach, um, this is uh, very good to see. My question was, uh, I wanted to um, request for a slightly higher or bird's eye uh, view of, of um of this uh, in a AU EU innovation partnership within the broader context, how this fits in. I think one of the challenges we often have, of course, is um, there are so many things happening at the same time. And I think um, it's a challenge always to bring them together in a way that would achieve the type of impact that we want to see. Um, so I just wanted to ask um, um, a bit more about how that uh, things fit together on the bigger, uh, the, the bigger map or puzzle. Thank you, Moses. Dr. Vincenzo, please. Yeah, thank, thank you, Laura. Thank you very much. So uh, perhaps I will start from the, the latter question and then we, we move to the one on Horizon Europe, if that's OK. Uh, and thank you, Moses, for, for, for your question there. Uh, perhaps I, I, I don't mean to monopolize the screen, but perhaps if you let me share my screen very quickly, I will go back to a, a joint presentation that was given by uh, Mr. Lukovicke from Odenepat. And, and myself uh, at the UNGA Science Summit in New York, and perhaps trying to answer your question, Moses, on the policy context, where does it all fit? So this AU EU innovation agenda is indeed was uh, conceived in line with these initiatives that are done at global level, like the UN SDGs 2030 agenda, and at the same time, at African and European level. So the AU agenda 2063 and also CISA 2024 and CISA 16. 25, as well as the AUC, the DTS 2020-2030. Uh, and, and, and on the EU side, the EU comprehensive strategy with Africa and the EU global approach to research and innovation. So uh, also the language is, 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 is used in a way that is consistent and it really matches with the ambitions of such policy documents. And perhaps going uh, to the instruments, and I'll try and, and summarize it with this slide here. So here, what you see is an overview of the instruments that so far we can uh, uh, put in terms of initiatives that will enable the implementation of the at least short-term actions of the AU EU innovation agenda. And I take this opportunity also to flag the InnoWhite call from Eureka. And uh, if you just type InnoWhite uh, call Eureka, there's opportunities there for SMEs from both Africa and Europe that are willing to, to, to really explore opportunities to sell the innovations or to at least commercialize at some point the innovations within Africa and Europe respectively. The uh, call is open until November 15th, so please have a look if you are running an SME in that space. But just to see amongst these initiatives is also Horizon Europe. So as you know, Horizon Europe is organized in uh, work programs of every two years. So what we, we can tell is that uh, the next work program, like the, the, the first work program has just finished, coming to an end, the next work program for 2023-2024, will be designed, is being designed in a way that for the so-called Africa Initiative 2, which is the package of topics that are encouraging or even requiring participation in the consortia for Africa-based institutions, 
we'll make sure that it fits with the uh, thematic areas and the actions of the agenda in a ways that indeed provides its contribution to the implementation of some of the short-term actions indeed. But it cannot do it all, and that's why we need more instruments. And this is the time where we are indeed having discussions on uh, with, with, with other international financial institutions to find uh, multiply really the tools and the instruments through which we can implement the actions. So Horizon Europe is certainly one of them, and the calls will be consistent to the agenda. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Vincenzo. I think we have uh, another question from Stefan. Thank you very much, uh, Norhan, and thanks very much to the speakers uh, before and to the organizers of this event. Uh, I would like uh, to point, um, and, and perhaps for those who do not know me, I was uh, coordinating together with CSR STEPRI, uh, the working work package on actors, alliances, and policies in LEAP for FNSSA. And we developed the program and innovation management cycle, meta governance model, as well uh, as we developed a bit further the theory of change and impact pathway method uh, and suggest this as elements of the future IRC platform. I want to point to um, the cross-cutting functions of um, potential platforms that we are building and not only referring to the IRC platform. Um, we have um, now uh, we are about to have three uh, roadmaps or agendas. We have a roadmap on FNSSA from 2016. We have a roadmap uh, on CCSE, climate change and sustainable energy from 2017. And very soon we will have an innovation agenda, which is also a policy paper. As far as I know it, it's a bit more oriented also towards the implementation, but we are struggling still um, on uh, the implementation of these so-called roadmaps or agendas. And um, the overlapping functions of these platforms that we are working on, and by the way, we had also here the coordinator from LIPRI, the Long-Term European African Partnership on Renewable Energies. I think he's not here anymore, but I'm also involved in this project. We are also there trying to establish um, a platform to support the AU-EU partnership. So the question is to uh, you, Vincenzo, I'm not sure whether we also have a colleague here from the African Union Commission because it's addressed to both um, then of you and in particular the HLPD Bureau, how do you foster um, in the very close future, I hope, or how do you ensure to initiate a, a serious discourse in the HLPD and in particular in the senior officials meetings um, about the question of governance of the partnership, governance of the platforms. Um, again, for example, we are suggesting uh, a cyclic programming approach. Um, how do you en ensure a discourse in the HLPD senior officials meeting about the platform building process? The IRC platform here gives an example. We are in a very good way, I, I would say. And how uh, do you address the issue of the development and establishment of a coordination infrastructure? And again, I'm also addressing this uh, cross-cutting um, quality of um, a potential coordination infrastructure because we have the topic of knowledge management and communication. We have the funders and the funders networks, research and innovation and capacity building. There are so many overlapping issues uh, from a technical operational perspective that um, could be supported by a coordination infrastructure. So how do you, Vincenzo, and if you have a colleague from the African Union Commission here as well, how do you ensure that we have in the very close future uh, a serious discourse in the senior officials meetings of the HLPD? Because there, the 82 member states in theory should be always represented and decisions uh, will have to be made. And one um, elephant in the room, so to say, is, for example, how do we finance a coordination infrastructure that everybody needs, uh, but it's difficult. Thank you for, uh, and sorry for this long question. <laughs> Thank you, Stefan, so much. Dr. Vincenzo, please. Thank, thank you, Nora, and thank you, Stephanie, if I may. Uh, I mean, very, very, very complex question. I, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's indeed a very complex one. Perhaps I'll try, uh, I will try and answer it by saying, well, first of all, how do we, do, do we make sure we tackle this point? I would say by having this conversation. So uh, as you brought it up, I think by starting this conversation and having it, and indeed keeping it into consideration, I think in some of the, well, in some of the points that you raised in your question, you, uh, you, you somehow are 
uh, provided me with inputs to, to the answer uh, is the point of uh, looking at the, the cycling programming approach. It's indeed something that is very much linked to the, to, to the governance, at least in my, in my view, if, if we look now, for instance, at the FNSSA partnership, you know, and the role of the IRC there, I think that is something that will be very much needed to indeed go through a cycling program, programming approach and really take stock on how we, uh, we, we move forward for according to the timeline of the actions as well. And indeed, uh, your part of the question on who, who funds what and how, uh, and also this is also why I, you know, I, uh, we're looking at uh, the fact that the HLPD, for instance, vis-a-vis -vis the IRC would be a steady inter interlocutor indeed to have that conversation and to, to see what, what's coming out of the opportunities that the IRC is also able to catalyze for itself. I mean, looking at the European Commission, of course, I, I can only reply on the EC, from the EC side, but the European Commission is not to be seen necessarily uh, just a funder nor a permanent funder of an entity such as the IRC, because indeed the sustainability element is of key, is of key importance. And I, I believe Dr. Irene would echo this. I, I take the liberty of saying that. So, so really I would say by having this conversation, keeping the governance aspect in the conversation and to report, uh, you know, and to have this conversation with the Bureau and also the discussion with the senior official meetings, but also looking at the importance of platforms and initiatives to at some point to, to be able to walk on their, on their feet and to also include the sustainability aspect. I don't know if I'm answering at least parts of these complex uh, questions. Oh, well, I mean, it was indeed provocative to raise such a question. Uh, allow me to be uh, uh, very briefly, very straightforward. My suggestion here is that we uh, reserve a time slot in the next HLPD senior officials meeting to discuss these issues and to invite um, projects, um, work package leaders or the coordinators of projects like Leap for FNSSA, like LIPRI, uh, so that we can discuss with uh, the potential 82 member states present um, these solutions that we found already here in the project, valuable solutions, and um, also to share the visions and, and what is furthermore needed, because these 82 member states, the ministries represented there, which are more than 82, these are the ones at least who make decisions on public uh, money, on taxes payers' money, and there the decision will have to be made, how can we invest there in the future, and if we do not, initiated this course there, then it is nice to have a conversation here indeed, and we share good ideas, this is important. But at the end, the decision makers should be aware about that and which decisions are expected from them. And I do not see this so far. So please take this as an inspiration. Thank you very much, Vincenzo. Thank you, Thank you Stefan. I think we have just time for the final comment from Irene, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Lauren. Thank you, um, everyone. I had um, raised my hand to respond or add a point to respond to Moses' question in terms of, you know, looking at the bigger picture. And I think it says you, you, you did a good job to bring that forward. The only thing I wanted to add uh, to Moses is, is that the, the, the cooperation between the AU and EU is predicated on on priorities that the HLPD sets. And, and of course, the first one was set on the food, nutrition, security, and sustainable agriculture. And as uh, Stefan said, of course, a roadmap was developed. Then a second uh, one was set on the um, climate change and uh, sustainable energy, CCSC. Again, uh, another set of um, uh, projects and processes followed. Now we have at the center of it, the one, the priority on STI, which again, I think the innovation agenda is advancing that. Important for us to recognize what's going on, paying attention to these priorities and actually linking what each of these priorities are doing. Re recognizing the actors, so far as FNSSA is concerned, the actors across the different priorities are the same. And that's why the, the IRC role, the interlocutor role that um, Dr. Vincenzo mentioned is absolutely important that we pay attention in terms of how we're galvanizing all these efforts across the different priorities and having a platform like an IRC that, that brings to the fore 
what needs doing to get the, the impact that gets actions to scale and that gets sustainability and ensuring that the, the actions we take at the local level actually ratchet up to what we're looking for at the bicontinental and of course um, uh, global level. So our discussion today is actually to bring to the fore that a platform like the IRC and, and the role that was so eloquently presented, the roles that were presented by Dr. Vincenzo um, are key and the conversation that I think Stefan is wanting to have should be had within that context. Uh, that we, we move together and see the, the synergies that need to be built across from one priority uh, to the other uh, as the AU EU high level policy dialogue uh, begins to um, take stock of what's going on and set, set new ones as we move forward. So that, that was what I wanted to, to add to the conversation. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Irene. And um, unfortunately, I have to end this webinar. We ran a little bit over time, but I think it was a very uh, interesting discussion. Uh, we hope that we can continue in uh, other events. I would like to thank our esteemed speakers and the attendees for the discussion. And I would like to thank also everyone who joined our series of webinars for the Leap for FNSSA in the past four years. And we look forward to uh, having you in future events of the IRC. Carlo has shared the website where you can find the recorded video of the webinar and the presentations, and you can also join uh, the IRC. Thank you, everyone, and I hope to see you all soon. Thank you.